Welcome everybody to another episode in our series on rock and roll history. In this episode, we're taking a look at the early work of psychedelia and progressivism, specifically folk rock and blues rock, which we don't really associate with psychedelia or progressivism, but they certainly laid the groundwork for both of these genres. With blues rock, we would have bands like Fleetwood Mac and the Allman Brothers laying the foundations for a lot of the blues-style rock that would shape the 1970s. But we would also have artists like Woody Guthrie, Joan Baez, and Bob Dylan that would help shape things like labor politics music and protest songs. So in this episode, we're going to take a look at blues rock and folk rock and learn more about how it could lay the foundations for the later 1970s psychedelia and progressive rock movements. Let's begin. was not just a genre that developed in the United States. It would also develop over in the UK, where rock artists trying to reinvent the genre would combine the work of earlier blues musicians, which we sort of touched on in last episode. But there would be very unique styles of blues rock that would develop during the early 1970s slash late 1960s. We would get the British style, which would feature Eric Clapton and Fleetwood Mac, but we would also get an American style headed by groups like Canned Heat, as well as artists like Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix. We'd also have a sort of Southern rock in the United States with groups like Leonard Skinner and the Allman Brothers, and heavy blues rock, uh, fronted predominantly like Led Zeppelin. So let's take a closer look at these four types of blues rock that developed in the late 1960s and early 1970s and learn more about how it would shape rock music history. British blues rock largely came out of the 1950s and early 1960s when a lot of British bands gained a lot of inspiration from American acoustic blues. But in 1958, Muddy Waters would change that when he came to the UK to perform his style of Chicago blues utilizing the electric guitar. Now, there were already British blues bands like the Rolling Stones and the Yardbirds just starting out and starting to get famous. But with the introduction of the electric guitar into blues over the UK, we would get Groups like Blues Incorporated, formed by guitarist Alexis Corder and his partner Cyril Davies. Now, the band Blues Incorporated would really be the first internal inspiration for blues rock. It would give us the band Cream, and would also evolve the Rolling Stones into much of what we think of the Rolling Stones as today. It created this British blues boom that would lay the foundations for the creation of the band The Blues Breakers, led by John Mayall, but which included Eric Clapton and later Peter Green. We would also see Eric Clapton continue the work of British blues through his band's Derek and the Dominoes, and Blind Faith, along with his solo career. Out of the band The Blues Breakers, we also had their rhythm section, led by Mick Fleetwood and John McVie, who would form Fleetwood Mac, which would also continue the legacy of British blues rock. We would also see, in the late 1960s, Jeff Beck, an alumnus of the Yardbirds, move into a little bit of a heavier rock genre, but continuing the blues rock legacy with his band, the Jeff Beck Group. Out of the Yardbirds, we would get guitarist Jimmy Page, creating a new band called the New Yardbirds, which would eventually become Led Zeppelin, which also continued the British blues rock legacy. Over in the United States, there was a single band slash artist 
that also seemed to work as an inspiration for the evolution of blues rock over in the U.S. as well. And that was Paul Butterfield with his band. Just like with the Blues Breakers in Britain, Paul Butterfield, along with his accompanying band, will lay the foundations for a new wave of blues rock in the United States. His work would inspire the band's canned heat, uh, early work by Jefferson Airplane, and individual musicians like Janis Joplin, Johnny Winter, and even Jimi Hendrix into creating a new version of rock that was in part inspired by the work of British blues rock, but also inspired by early American blues as well, bringing that old blues influence back into American rock music. Now, their work would also inspire a lot of showmanship as well, specifically Jimi Hendrix with his band, The Jimi Hendrix Experience, which would inspire the band Band of Gypsies, and the Band of Gypsies would inspire numerous other bands for their guitar virtuosity and showmanship on stage. Now, blues rock in the United States would also inspire a new wave of music in the southern U.S., a southern rock uh, blues style. And this would largely be thanks to the work of the bands like the Allman Brothers Band and Leonard Skinner and later ZZ Top, which incorporated country elements into their style to produce the distinct genre Southern Rock. During the 1970s, blues rock in both the United States and in the UK would largely slowly evolve into a more heavy metal style, with the exception of bands like Status Quo and Foga. The cause for this change was pretty early on, bands like the Jimi Hendrix Experience and Cream would start incorporating elements of jazz into their music, uh, specifically playing long, involved improvisations into their music. And this would lead to a sort of psychedelic sound that we'll talk about in a future episode. But by the 1970s, blues rock in both the UK and the US had become heavier and more riff-based, largely thanks to the work of bands like Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple. And this would create a bit of a uh, merging of blues rock with hard rock, where the differences between the genres were pretty subtle. And a lot of the blues rock bands started evolving into a harder rock sound as they began recording more rock-style albums. At about the same time, we would also see folk rock developing. We would have labor politics with a lot of protests happening in the United States, creating a new form of music that would combine rock with labor songs and this was pretty popular with Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger but we would also have protest songs which were specifically not necessarily about labor strikes but in some cases anti-Vietnam protest songs and other forms of protest and we would get groups and individuals like Joan Baez and Bob Dylan leading these groups. The folk rock era would see two main geographic hubs, California, led by the Mamas and the Papas, and New York City, led by Simon and Garfunkel. So let's take a closer look at the labor politics music, the protest music, the California folk rock music scene, and the New York City folk rock music scene and learn about how these four types of music would come to shape rock and roll history. During the 1960s, blues was not the only American music genre having a revival movement. There was also American folk music having a revival, and this was thanks in part to the work of artists like Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger, who would combine labor movements of the era with folk music to create a new genre of labor politics music. 
Now, thanks to the work of Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger and other artists like them, combining progressivism and labor politics with American folk music revival, we had artists like Joan Baez and Bob Dylan. And these two artists would lay the foundations for an explosion in American music. Joe Baez and Bob Dylan played pretty exclusively folk music. Uh, Bob Dylan getting famous for his hits Blown in the Wind and Masters of War in the early 1960s, which brought protest songs to a larger public. But even during the era of Joe Baez and Bob Dylan, folk revival music and rock music were still pretty separate genres with usually mutually exclusive audiences. The big crossover of folk music and rock music probably came from the Animals' performance of House of the Rising Sun in 1964, which was the first commercially successful folk song to be recorded with rock and roll instrumentation. But there was also the Beatles' I'm a Loser in 1964, which was arguably the first song the Beatles were directly influenced by Bob Dylan. In 1965, we had the Birds record Bob Dylan's Mr. Tambourine Man, which would top the charts. And this is where things really take a shift for folk music in the U.S. Over in Los Angeles, California, the Birds were this band that were largely playing small-scale coffee shops. But thanks to their inclusion of drums and a 12-string Rickenbacker guitar, the band would make a major name for themselves in this corner of rock music. Now, their adoption of combining folk music with rock instrumentation would create a major evolution in American rock music that would even go back to affect Bob Dylan, who began adopting electric instruments, even though this intensely angered uh, many folk purists who saw his performance of Like a Rolling Stone, even though it became a U.S. hit single, be almost a knife in the back uh, to folk music revival. Now, over in, back in California, folk rock was changing dramatically, thanks to the work of bands like the Mamas and the Papas, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, uh, and even the Loving Spoon and Simon and Garfunkel were changing their sounds as well uh, over in New York. But this created this huge evolution where California was developing a new genre of rock apart from the bands over in New York where they were having their own version of folk rock develop apart from those bands like Simon and Garfunkel over in New York City. And this would lay the foundations for the later half of the 1960s and the rock genres that would dominate the later half of that decade. The work of blues rockers and folk rockers would help develop very regional styles of rock music. We've got the British blues rock as well as American blues rock, but we have a very distinctive sound developing in the southern United States with groups like the Allman Brothers. We have New York City music scene getting its sort of beat movement with groups like Bob Dylan and Simon and Garfunkel. And over in California, we've got a unique style of folk rock developing, not just because of groups like we learned about from last week, like the Beach Boys, but groups that we learned about this week with the Mamas and the Papas. So in next week's episode, we're going to take a closer look at how these further developed to give us the progressive rock genre and the psychedelic rock genre. And for that, I'll see you in that next episode.